afternoon, everyone. It is the last day of the month. Happy Halloween. It's October 31st. Uh, I'm joining from Amiskwichi, Wiskigan. I'm eager to see the little ghosts and goblins that are out there. Uh, you know, this is a really good time for our kids just to be in community, to get that candy, that chocolate. Uh, so I hope everyone's having a good day. I hope you also got a little bit of chocolate yourself. I know I have Reese peanut butter cups. Those are my favorites. Uh, so just really acknowledging the gift of this day and, you know, what we're learning, what season we're in. Also, perhaps thinking about what's on the horizon. You know, creators always surrounding us, us with goodness, you know, making sure that we're walking our path, honoring our spirit, um, being with community and just being a good ancestor, being a, or being a good neighbor, we'll say, being a good neighbor to the world that we're a part of. Uh, I, I, for one, am just such a fan of these little rabbits that are, that are in my neighborhood and community, my relatives. And so that reminds me, we never walk alone. That creator has always surrounded us with good goodness, good energy. So we are very fortunate today to have the one and only Kate Morris to be with us. So it's my honor to introduce her. Um, but just take a moment before we rush into this, just take a moment and hold that gratitude from you, when your head lifted that pillow this morning to this very moment. I just want you to take a moment just to think about one thing that you are grateful for. Just hold it in that heart center and may that guide you. I think when we go into any learning, it's, it's good to have you know, the good energy, that good medicine in our hearts. So we can receive whatever is going to be taught to us in a good way. So I thank Creator for the gift of, of this moment that we can learn virtually. Uh, for our guest speaker, uh, you know, we're always, always amazed um, at the knowledge that's being shared, uh, the goodness and the wisdom that is out in our, our Indigenous communities and peoples. So we just acknowledge and honor the gift of, of Innovate BC. So you've joined us this Tuesday afternoon. All right. Well, I'm going to pass this this virtual mic off to our friend. She's been a dear friend with Can Do for some time now. So it's always a, a pleasure to have her join us. So she's talking about today personal budgeting for entrepreneurs. And I think budgeting budgeting is a, a really good topic to talk about, to consider our finances and financial literacy is so, so important. And I really believe so necessary um, within our nations and organizations, even within our own personal home fires. So developing a su successful personal finance plan can help oneself, loved ones, and communities reach financial stability, security, autonomy, abundance, and a peace of mind. We all want that. A, crit a critical step in the process of developing a successful financial plan is the use of a personal budget. This personal budget created with a meaningful goals and relatable to one's personal circumstances is the launching point for other financial successes, such as managing credit usage, creating savings, growing assets, and moving towards a financially stable retirement. All good things. So she's going to take us on this journey this afternoon. So a little bit about our guest speaker. She's the founder of Scout Financial Solutions, she is a Dakota woman and a registered band member of the George Gordon First Nation located in Treaty 4 territory. So she resi resides in Regina, Saskatchewan, where she's an active community member, passionate entrepreneur, and you will see that shines through her, and financial literacy advocate. Kate is the founder of Scout Financial Solutions, a financial literacy education and consulting business that provides personal finance, finance life skills with an emphasis of knowledge sharing in the Indigenous community. Vital financial wellness content is shared through engaging 
and memorable group workshops and individual consultations. So she's gonna, she rocks. She's a rock star <laughs> in this field. She knows what she's talking about. And every time that I've sat in her workshop, I've always had a takeaway. I've always had something that I'm gonna apply to my life so that, you know, she talked about living in abundance and having that freedom and financial peace. So she really brings some really good medicine around financial literacy. So we welcome you. We thank you that you've created some time and space for us. So I'm going to pass this virtual mic off to you. Welcome, welcome, Kate. Thank you very much, Michelle. Wow, I'm so honored uh, to be here and present with Can Do uh, again and with yourselves. And uh, thank you, Elsie, for connecting me online today. I'll get right into the meat and bones of everything because I know everybody wants to get going and learning some really good healthy money management tips. So welcome. Let me just turn this on here. Oh, it's not going. So technological glitch here, guys. We're not clicking forward. I apologize for that. Oh, it's not. It's frozen. It's completely frozen. Is there a... No, it's not. There we go. So thank you, Candu, and thank you, Innovate BC. I love the program. I love that you're sharing tidbits of knowledge and wellness on a regular basis. And that's such a fantastic opportunity and people will be able to connect with different tidbits and information that they um, that are really relatable to themselves. So uh, that is my business card. My name is Kate Morris. Uh, I guess I don't have to connect too much. I'll just kind of go through what I've been doing. I've been studying personal finance for more than 25 years. And most definitely, it started out of necessity. I was a young, widowed parent, uh, raising my children on my own. And I struggled with money. I struggled with bringing money in. But I also struggled with managing the money that I did have coming in. So out of necessity, I really studied personal finances. I read everything I could. I went to all the workshops. I purchased all the books. And I studied everything that I possibly could. And I loved it. So much that I actually became a certified financial education instructor. And I have told two designations on top of my business degree. Uh, I've been on a matriarch mission since forever, just really trying to change the narrative for Indigenous people, for people who are starting out with very little resources or support or very little understanding or comprehension of what's going on financially. Um, so I am also a very passionate entrepreneur and I love sharing my lived experiences in my entrepreneurship journey because a lot of times people don't know what they need to know and they don't ask what they need to ask because we don't know so I try to do the best I can to share healthy knowledge in terms of personal finances business finances entrepreneurship journeys all of those wonderful things all in the intention of creating uh, abundance for yourselves 100% abundance so I really appreciate uh, yourselves um, reaching out to me and connecting today so just depending for your thoughts, if you're comfortable, please comment in the chat your name, uh, where you're joining us from, and any type of business information or links or websites that you'd like to share, because this is a great opportunity for networking. And I'll just thank you for sharing for those of you who do as I proceed through the workshop. So very quickly, I also wanted to encourage uh, people when because a lot of times when we talk about money there seems to be a triggering factor to it and a lot of times it's a negative tr triggering factor element so I just want to encourage you right now in this moment that whatever you feel whatever you think or whatever you however you may respond knowingly or unknowingly that is perfectly fine it's okay because sometimes life just happens and it doesn't necessarily mean we're bad with money or we don't deserve it. It just means that we're going through these things and all of them have a different financial component to them that we need to understand. And sometimes, honestly, we just need to know what we need to know about money. So know that you are capable and worthy of understanding how money works in your life and being able to manage it to the best of your capacity in order to reach and attain your stability your security and your goals and objectives so are you ready to get in the know about your dough the difference between who you are and who you want to be is what you do and today what we're going to do is personal budgeting for entrepreneurs because they have a unique type of income source and income revenue that sometimes adjusts or fluctuates so we want to make sure that we tackle understanding building a basic budget but also 
some of the tips and tricks that can help you navigate through changes and fluctuations in that revenue. So what is a budget? Well, basically a lot of people can refer to it as a spending plan. And it's exactly like having an estimate, like, sorry, it's an estimate of your income and your expenses for a set period of time. And I always liken it to like a money map. It helps you to arrive at your set desired financial destinations. So it kind of, um, it's like a plan on how you're going to be spending the money that you bring in. And it helps with making informed decisions for yourself and your household. It helps with your financial well-being, which is pretty apparent, pretty obvious. But it also helps with your overall emotional, physical, psychological, and spiritual well-being. And what we see that is like the same with the medicine wheel, to have a healthy balance in your life so that you're able to manage things with reason and with intention and with decision-making capacities. Um, definitely managing your life on a budget or a spending plan allows to reduce some stress management in your life. And it helps with those life goal achievements. So a lot of people have these hopes, these dreams, these um, desires to accomplish something. Having a budget or a spending plan and how you're going to be spending your money will help you in attaining those things. So we're going to talk about very quickly to help you get to reach those goals, we're going to talk about the five steps to building a budget for yourself. Step one is the goals and the whys. Step two is talking about your total net income and capturing that number on a monthly basis or a pay period basis. We're going to talk about step three, which is your total expenses. Step four is balancing that budget. And step five is managing the cash flow. So we'll walk you through these five steps very quickly, but just know that there's only five basic steps to building a budget or a spending plan that is workable for you. So step one, we want to set some goals for yourself. This is where personal finance becomes very personal. It's only going to be yourselves who are going to set the goals that you want to receive, that you want to, um, sorry, you want to reach. So for your, myself, it was, I wanted to purchase a home because I had instability and security in my life. So I wanted to make sure I had, I purchased a home for my children that I could raise them into their own home. So when we talk about setting goals, everyone's going to have different hopes and dreams. If you want to buy a car, maybe you have some debt that you want to pay off. If you want to own your own place, like I did, I wanted to purchase a home. You might have family that you want to help out, or you want to maybe start going to post-secondary education programs. Or maybe you want to return to school because you've had to take a, you'd had to have taken a break from it. Or for those entrepreneurs, those budding entrepreneurs out there, maybe you want to launch your own business. A healthy money tip I have for yourselves is when you're reaching goals and setting goals, you need to make sure that those goals are goal smart. And I think most people are familiar with the goal smart uh, acronym is for now, right? So we want to make sure that you're just setting something that's going to be attainable. It's going to be measurable, meaning $600 in six months. It's going to be realistic. You're not saying I'm going to save a million dollars within three months time. And it's time sensitive to have that time on there. So a lot of times at this point in my workshops, I stop people and I say, I just want you to draw a great big thought bubble and write down something that you want to set for yourself. What are your hopes and dreams? You know, I encourage you. I know that we don't have a lot of time here in this moment, but take a moment sometime this evening or this week draw that thought bubble and think about what do I really want for myself? What makes me happy? What drives me forward? There's got to be something that everybody has and chances are there's a money connotation to it. There's a relation of money and how you're able to manage your money to reach those goals. So like I said, by all means, write down your goals. And then the second step of that is when you have your big thought bubble and you've written down your goal is write the why. My why for setting the home ownership goal for myself was because I didn't have a lot of secure uh, shelter as a child and as a preteen and as a youth growing up. I actually had been living on my own since I was 15 and a half years of age and I had instability in terms of housing. So I really wanted to make sure as I grew up, that was one of my life goals to make sure that when I became a mother, I would never have to have my children have instability in that area. So it was really important for me. My goal was home ownership. My why was because I wanted to break that cycle of, of housing instability. Once you've set those two, those two um, points for yourself, your goals and your why, step one of creating your own personal workable budget is complete. That's the first step of it. 
Step two is just you want to determine your income. And we want when we talk about income, I always say that we all have our own, we all earn our own 100% of our income. So um, we might have different values in that 100%, but everybody earns 100%. So we try to make sure we do the best we can with it. But when we talk about income as well, I want to talk about the definition that a lot of people will kind of relate to it. Uh, money is received in exchange for any providing any type of a good or a service or through investment capital, such as interest. So for a lot of entrepreneurs, you're going to be selling a product or a service to your customers, your client base, and then they'll exchange it with money, which will be your income, your business revenue. But know very that there is extremely close relationship between a personal budget and an entrepreneur or a business revenue, because the revenue that you bring in needs to not only meet the obligations of the business, but you're in business to earn money to provide for yourself. So the revenue also has to be able to provide a good enough income to pay for all the things that you need in your personal life. And there's two types of income that you have to always consider when you're creating your own workable budget for yourself and or for your business. So the gross income is the total income before any type of deductions taken off. So that would be uh, Canada Pension Plan deductions, uh, CPP, any type of workplace healthcare program or um, life insurance or any of those types of things. The gross income is what you earn but the net income is after all of the deductions. That's actually the income that hits your bank account. It's your take-home pay. And if you're not sure what your net income is, take a look at your paychecks on payday and see what you're actually bringing in for net income. Again, a tip I have here, a healthy money tip, is that when you're creating your own personal workable budget, you have to make sure that you use your net income, the actual amount that hits your account. I did work with a client once and she was struggling with her budget that we had worked on because um, she was budgeting using her gross income and she didn't understand why she was falling short. And so we, when I finally was able to sit and look at, at the numbers with her, because I usually don't look at customer numbers, client numbers, that's their personal income. I just try to help them through the steps. But when we had a chance to sit down and take a look, we realized that she was budgeting with her gross income, which inflated the actual money that she was budgeting to spend in her budget and her spending plan. So keep that in mind when you're budgeting, you want to use the amounts that hit your account, your take home, your net pay. There's also an important element that I think people need to uh, hear when we're starting to create a budget, because a lot of times they don't know where to start. So they have to understand that there are different pay periods. And a lot of times budgets reflect your specific pay period. So monthly pay period means you're getting paid once per month, you're receiving 12 pay periods per year. Semi-monthly is paid twice per month, 24 paychecks per year. Bi-weekly, you're actually getting paid every second week, which is 26 pay periods per year, two more than the semi-monthly. It might be the same amount when you add it all up, but keep in mind when you're creating your budget, that income will come in at different times. Others are paid weekly, which means you're actually working with 52 paychecks. And for entrepreneurs, a lot of times when they're selling their product, their income is considered at the point of sale, meaning they sold a product or they sold 10 products at an event and they consider that their income and that's the point of sale is when they bring in their revenue. So I always tell people when you're creating your budget, keep those things in mind so you don't run into money problems somewhere within that month. And a healthy money tip I have for you here, aim to have more than one source of income. We saw a lot of people struggle through, through COVID because they actually put all their eggs in one basket in terms of revenue and income earning, and they didn't have other sources of income. When the COVID affected income or jobs or opportunities ended, they lost all of their income. So they, were a, they weren't able to pay, make their um, obligations. So they lost, some people lost their vehicles, some people lost their businesses, some people lost their homes. So it's so critically important to create savings for such things. We'll talk about that quickly or in a minute, but also to have more than one source of income so that if you have secured income sources coming in, if one stops, then you have opportunity to still have those other incomes coming in. And that'll help with you making sure that you have some level of stability and security in your, in your income. So normally in a workshop, we would have this worksheet. If anybody would like a copy of it, by all means, get a hold of CanDo or get a hold of myself and I'll be able to email a PDF copy out. 
but we would be able to list all of our net income sources. And I created this sheet that actually tries to capture as many different sources of opportunity, income opportunities that there are available. Some may not apply to you, some may. You may have your own unique ones, but I thought at least if we put it out in some paper and it can reflect with people, it captures income quicker for them as opposed to missing out on something that they might not have considered or thought as income. So you wanna list all your income sources, your net, which is the amount that hits your account, add it up as a monthly total. And then if you wanna find out how much you're earning per year, you just simply time that, times that by 12. Once you've done that, step two of creating your own personal workable budget is complete. You've listed your monthly take-home income and you're also your annual take-home income. Step three is determining those expenses. So when we talk about expenses, just the same way that I talk about income in terms of all of us having our own 100%, whether it's a huge, great, big, juicy 100% or a more menial 100%, we still have our own 100% that we have to um, utilize. So true, so true is also, sorry, so too is the same with expenses. You're gonna have, you're, you're gonna utilize all of your income towards your expenses, but we wanna make sure that we do it in terms of having a whole, the wholeness of similar to what the medicine world teachings are. We're gonna be able to manage four categories in terms of our money. And I created this program, this, um, system because I found it was really labor intensive and very confusing to try to give every dollar a home specifically like 3% here and 6% there and you can't buy a shirt until you have 27% saved up for a shirt or things like that and I just felt it was really complex so I started thinking about some of the ways we wanted to be able to balance healthy money in our lives so I created a system where there's basically only four areas where your money needs to go and if you stick to a system like this You've met all your obligations, you'll create savings, and you'll be able to just spend whatever's left over, worry-free, stress-free, without tracking, without feeling any type of guilt or shame. So the four areas are number one, all your must-pays. That's paying everything that you need to survive. And that means your shelter, your food, any obligations that you've committed yourself to, transportation, anything that's going to create your next dollar revenue for yourself as an entrepreneur. That means vehicle license, business license, those types of things. Those are things that you must pay. Step two, or pardon me, part two is short and midterm savings. Uh, that's areas where you want to be able to create something in, for the just in case, such as an emergency fund. I find a lot of people, Indigenous people and entrepreneurs don't operate with an emergency fund. They need to be able to have something set aside for them for those just in case scenarios and situations. Midterm savings or other things that you might be considering, like you want to take a trip in five years, or let's say you haven't even started your business yet and you're hoping to open it within five years, you want to be able to start creating some type of savings plan for that. And sometimes savings also includes paying off debt, which is a form of savings in a way because then at least the money's not going there. It's actually going to reduce the obligations you have. The third area is longer, more meaningful savings. That's like thinking about retirement in 10 or 20 or 15 years or whatever it may be. That might be thinking about home ownership in 10 years and creating money and resources and saving for that for within 10 years. And there might be other opportunities for yourself or something that you have personally set as a goal for yourself. And once you've created, you've addressed these four areas, the fourth area is just life. Whatever is left over after the three areas of committing yourself regularly to those three areas for a healthy money balance in your life. The fourth area is just the fun area, the life, the things that you want to do and enjoy for yourself. The main point is to plan for your 100% of your net take-home income. So very quickly, we'll go through the must-pays just in case you're not familiar with the, some of the things or you might not consider all of the things that you must pay in your personal life from your business revenue. Just like there is two sources of income, there are two sources of bills. Fixed expense is any cost or expense that you cannot change. It's been set by somebody else. And a really good example of this would be rent. You, if the landlord says it's $1,200 a month, you can't really go back and say, I'll give you eight and then try to negotiate that. If it's 12 and you've signed the lease, it's $1,200 a month. That's something that you must pay every month in order to have shelter. A variable expense is something that you actually have influence on. You can change that. It's something that you can 
um, negotiate is something that you can reduce is something that you could even increase not knowingly having kind of some cost creep there. Uh, an example of that would be your cable and internet package at home. You might have all the channels and all the bells and whistles on your cable package, but you might also be paying the premium price for that. Alternatively, you could reduce some of that expenses and say, you know what, I'm going to cut back a little bit on my cable bill because I'm going to put that money towards something else that means a bit more to me. So you can see that there's flexibility on that. So whenever you're looking at your bills, take a look and see if some of them are fixed expenses, meaning they're a must pay. You have to pay that or a variable expense, meaning I can reduce some of the cost of that. Some examples of must pays would be, again, shelter, food, utilities, transportation, any type of insurances, um, any type of licenses that are required, contract obligations that you made. Um, there are some others, debt obligations. And I have a quick healthy money tip for you. If you have not yet done it, consider equalized payments for some of your basic utilities because that takes the guesswork out of having to decide to see how much each month is going to be, which will, that means you're going to be adjusting your budget significantly every month, whether it's a winter month or summer month. If you do an equalized payment plan, it actually tells you you're going to pay the same amount for 12 months. And at the end of those 12 months, you're either going to have a credit or you're going to have a minor um, uh, bill that you might have to settle out and pay. Another tip here though, Make sure you've lived in the place for 12 months before you go on equalized payment plan because the utility companies will determine the equalized payment amount based on the previous 12 months of usage. So if you've only lived there for three months and somebody else lived there for nine months and they had a huge family, they might make, a, make your um, EPP payment very large or conversely, they might make it very low if there was only a single person there and you actually lived there with more than one person. Another must pay is any debt obligations that you've legally committed yourself to. Credit cards, bank loans, and those business loans, bank overdrafts, Canada Revenue Agency, credit, any type of credit that's in collections, you need to address those. Um, SGI fines in Saskatchewan, I'm sure it's like that across the nation, that each province has their um, auto insurance companies and they charge you tickets, like if you get a speeding ticket, and then they have the surcharge on top of it. And the surcharge doesn't go away with the ticket, it actually grows. So if you have three tickets, you have additional surcharges on top of surcharge and top of sur surcharge. So consider making those obligations things that you must pay in part of your ex in, from your income. Other things are tickets, family obligations, a healthy money tip I have for you here. If you don't know what your legal debt obligations are, or something could be in collections or outstanding, Order a free copy of your credit report from Equifax and TransUnion. I have the uh, websites there, but I also do a financial literacy workshop on understanding credit and debt management, and I give a bit more detail and information in those. By all means, order the free one. Don't subscribe. And make sure that you actually get the credit report because credit scores don't necessarily capture what you owe in terms of long-term debt obligations. Um, savings. That's a huge component for yourselves. I think I'll, I think about our ancestors and some of the things that they've taught us is that they actually utilize 100% of the buffalo, right? 100% of your net income. They were able to manage through over all of the expenses, all of the obligations, but they also saved a portion of it. So we think about this. They actually process meat, fish, berries, medicines, and all those things for future use. And food preservation, which is a form of savings, ensured the survival of entire camps of our ancestors during leaner times. So the most key element here is that savings does matter and it is not a new concept to Indigenous people. Savings has been happening since millennia because that ensured future survivability for the people. So where should I start with my savings? Two very safe places. Emergency fund. If you have not yet started an emergency fund, please do. There are so many things that Indigenous people experience that are somewhat unique than other people. Like I'm not saying every, like everybody gets emergencies, but there are things sometimes we have a really strong family relationship with community members and people. And sometimes we end up having their emergencies become our, our emergencies. And we want to do what we can as, as good supportive community members to support others in their hardships, their times of need. Create an emergency fund for those types of purposes to self-sustain, 
but also to be able to support family if they require something. I think about this in terms of, let's say something happened and perhaps a family member went through a divorce and they live in a different province than you and they need to move home right away. If you don't have any resources, unfortunately, that loved one is at what's end there and they're in a, a dire situation. But if you have an emergency fund, you might be able to say, oh man, I'm glad I have this emergency fund. I can help out with a little bit or I can get a vehicle there or I can rent a, a moving van or something. So we think about that, not just in terms of uh, self-sustainability, but as who we are as community members and family members. Emergency fund, short and midterm savings goal. You want to build it within six months to one year at least. Um, you want to aim for at least $1,000. And then as you reach $1,000, you want to grow. You want to say $1,000 first. And then you might want to say, you know what? If I lost all income and my income month, my monthly expenses are $2,700, I'm going to save for $2,700 because that covers me for one month in case anything happens. We all went through the COVID lockdown. We saw what happened with people who didn't have any savings. And then once you have one month, you might say, you know what? I think I'd feel comfortable having three months of my must pays saved up for a just in case. So you can see how people want to be able to save money to support themselves in the event of job loss, health loss, um, loss of an income earner or a loved one in their household, family emergencies, refrigerator breaks down, your car needs new tires. All of those things are considered emergencies, but a lot of our people don't save for that. So it's important. You know, I'm a strong advocate for people creating some type of an emergency savings. And the reason, the goal for these is to protect yourself from any type of crisis that may come up in your future or your loved one's future. Second area of savings is planned spending. And that's just exactly as it sounds. You plan on spending that money at some point in your future. So short, midterm, and meaningful goal, meaningful uh, savings plans. You want to build it within months to years. It could take years. Again, if you plan on buying a house in 10 years, you may have a savings plan for 10 years. Um, you might want to spend for Christmas. That's another short-term savings, right? So you might say, well, Christmas happens December 25th, uh, January 1st, I'm going to start putting money away for the next December. So any types of savings that you plan on spending at a future use is really important to capture it somehow in your personal budget. I want to mention here that they can both be put into separate e-savings accounts. These e-savings e -savings accounts are free. They should be free from your financial institution and they should be an add-on offering from your basic checking or savings account. So we've covered the three areas of a personal budget, all the things you must pay to survive, including yourself, but also marrying it onto your business to making sure your business is earning enough to pay all your business obligations and to pay yourself enough personal income and revenue to meet your personal needs. We talked about short-term and emergency savings. We talked about um, specific savings that you might have, for example, creating a Christmas savings account and more meaningful savings like creating some type of a retirement investment plan or maybe perhaps a home purchase or anything like launching a business in five years or growing and developing it. Again, once you've covered these three areas in your personal budget and your income, everything that's left over is for yours. You spend it, you don't have to track it, you don't have to report it. You've met your obligations, you're thriving, you're growing, you're growing into abundance and stability and security. Whatever's left over is yours to spend. You can tap, 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 whatever's left over as much as you want, or you can make more informed decisions with yourself. You might increase it to the must pays because you have some debt you want to pay off, or you might increase your emergency fund so you feel safe and secure at three months of savings. Or you might say, you know what, I want to buy the home at eight years, so I'm going to put a little bit more towards a longer meaningful goal or you can just spend it it's yours because you are working on stable financial goals already so have at it and enjoy that life portion so again i do have this handout this worksheet if anybody wanted to get a copy of it this is listing all of your expenses. So um, you're going to add up your monthly totals. And if you look at this worksheet, all of the ones on one side, on the left side, are fixed expenses in the three categories of the medicine wheel. The fourth is life. Look at all those life um, category or those life categories and expenses, right? So if you do end up having to change things, you're going to change it from that life, that flexible, that variable expense side, as opposed to the fixed must play obligations. 
once you look at all of your worksheet or your expenses worksheet and complete all of the expenses for the month, that's step three completed of building your own basic budget. And a healthy money tip I have here for you, if you don't know how much you've been spending to date, take a look at some of your previous statements or you can start now and track for the next two to three months and see where you're spending. I wouldn't advise you to change your behavior quite just yet. Just can keep in mind that you do have these expenses and you're kind of looking at where they're going. So that way you kind of make more informed ch choices. I did work with a client. I, I volunteered to help out this young lady and her parent. And the challenge for them was that they were having some debt, some um, utility debt. And each month the parent was saying, I'll give you $300 next month. But she was doing it without having a budget. And it was so difficult because then she'd have to scramble next month because she didn't have something to sit down and look and say, you know what? I can give you 175 next month and then 225 the next month. So because she was overcommitting, trying to manage that debt obligation, the utility debt, she actually was putting them all into kind of a bit more um, treacherous territory because again, then they would have to scramble because they don't overcommitted that ways. Having a budget, if you have debt obligations, is a critical element, I think, for yourselves to be able to say, you know what? I have 625 left over, or I have 225 left over. I can give an extra $25, or I can give you an extra 75 next month, or those types of things, right? So you can see how having a budget that works for you actually uh, reduces a lot of stress, reduces a lot of anxiety, and actually will be able to help you make really powerful, informed decisions for yourself going forward. So, so far we've talked about setting our goals and our whys. We've talked about determining your net income and determining your expenses. Very quickly now, you just wanna compare your income to your expenses. So your income was basically your net income minus any all of your listed expenses, your must pays and some of your savings. And it will give you a budget balance on a monthly basis. And then by timesing it by 12, it gives you your annual budget balance. And what's going to happen here is you're going to see, sorry, that's step four of creating your budget balance. Step four is complete now. So we've set our goals and our whys. We've listed all of our net income. We've listed all of our expenses. And then we've, in, we've um, related our income to our expenses to see if our budget balance is going to be a positive, a negative, or a zero balance. So these are the three outcomes of creating that budget balance. A balance of zero means you spend exactly what you're earning. A balance that is a positive number greater than zero means you're spending less than you earn or you're actually earning more than you thought you were earning. A balance that is a negative number, which is less than zero, means that you spend more than you earn or you're not earning enough or possibly both could be happening but there's definitely cash problems and you want to make sure that you rebalance your budget as quickly as possible to make sure you're not operating in the negative uh, for a very long period of time. But whatever the case is, don't despair because all budgets can be adjusted to your corresponding actions to make changes. So what does taking action look like? If you need to rebalance your budget because it's a negative number or because you don't like how long it's going to take you to reach a goal, saving for that goal, or because you have some debt obligations you'd like to commit more of your money to, two things you can do, really. You're going to need to look at those costs, cutting those variable costs. The only way you can cut some fixed costs is you actually do really physical things, huge things like you might want to move to a more affordable place, or you might have to downsize a vehicle. You might have to do some of those big things for the fixed costs. For the variable costs, it could be a simply, something as simple as saying, you know what, I think I'll just cut down to two coffees a week for a little period of time and see how that goes. Or maybe I'll actually switch out this item for that item at the grocery store. Or maybe I'll just eat at home a little more. Or maybe I'll look at some secondhand shopping and see if there's something that I could find that suits me for what I need and actually works better with some of the, the clothing I have in my closet already. So that's the joy of creating your own budget is you have 1000% autonomy, freedom, independence to make those choices for yourself to say, what matters more to me? Once you've looked at cutting some of your costs, which is what most people usually do, 
The next thing you need to look at if you're still struggling or if you want to create more abundance in your life is you want to look at creating more income for yourself. As an entrepreneur, that might be streamlining what, what your um, brings in the most revenue for yourself. Um, you might want to consider looking for a new job. You might want to do a side hustle job where you have one or two things that you're doing on the side. You might want to do some retail arbitrage and flip some of the clothing that you're selling that you've purchased and that you need to sell now. There's a number of different things you can do to increase your revenue, but it's important for you to do what suits you best. If you're not a 6 a.m. person, I really wouldn't encourage you to look for a 6 a.m. gig. You want to do something that's still going to make you happy and feed your soul, but also keep you um, in a positive mindset when it comes to managing your resources, time as well as your financial resources is critical. Step five is cash flow now, right? So cash flow, we know about it in terms of a business element, but a lot of times people, when they talk about personal finances, creating your budget and managing your money, money uh, healthily, they don't talk about cash flow. And cash flow really is just managing your money as it comes in and making reminder and knowing when it needs to flow out of your household so that you don't have those terrible costly NSF bills and obligate um, but, um, banking fees. So a budget really for cash flow, you just want to make sure that you include dates in the mix of the picture. Cause a lot of times people will create a budget and they'll say, you know what? I have cash in hand this week. I'm going to go shopping. But if they created a budget, they would say, I can't spend that money this week because it's needed for the utilities next week. So that's the things that we want to do when we talk about cash flow. You really just want to make sure that you have something that lists when your money's coming in and making sure that you have money in the account for the days that it has to flow out of your account to meet all of your obligations. So it's really that simple to be able to manage your resources. Once you have created those dates and made sure you can do it however you want to do it. I just do mine on a basic binder and I just have it listed in order. And I actually have my budget binder here. So let me just open it up to November. Mine is just listed from beginning to end. So I know at the beginning of the month what's coming in and when everything's going out. Lately, it seems like there's more going out than coming in, but sometimes that's how it goes. So that's why it's so critical to live in a budget and to be able to manage your cash with the dates. So just a quick recap of the basics of budgeting. You want to set those goals and the whys. That makes it personal for you. That will help you, encourage you to say, I can't say yes today because I want to say yes to something tomorrow or the next week or the next month, or I have really good life goals and Spending that right now is not going to keep me on track to the life goals I set for yourself. You want to manage your own 100%, right? And everybody has a different 100%, but we still have freedom of choice to manage our 100%. You want to make sure that you spend all of your money, all of your expenses, number one, primarily on surviving. And that means all the things that you must pay to survive your home, your food, like the, uh, the shelter, if you're staying at somebody else's place, transportation, anything that actually is going to bring in revenue for yourself. And that might include a license or being able to meet some of your startup costs so that you can create additional revenue for yourself down the road. You want to make sure that your balance, that your budget balances, meaning that your income is greater than your expenses coming out of your account. Everything flowing into your household is covered by the income that's going into the household. So you want to make sure it balances. And if it doesn't balance, you're going to have to adjust it in some way. And you want to make sure that you match, watch the cash flow. When is it coming in? When must it go out? So I want to make sure that there's money in the account when it has to flow out. Now that we've covered the basics of creating a personable, workable budget for yourselves, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges as an entrepreneur with fluctuating income, and I'm in that category as well. I don't have the exact same income from client sources every month. So it's very similar. You have the four areas that you're gonna to have to manage. The must pays, short, creating short and midterm savings, creating meaningful savings and anything else, else's life. But with income fluctuations, the challenge is that some months could be slower than months than other months or busier. 
than other months. And that makes it really difficult to budget for future months. And so what it looks like, it looks like seasonal revenue. We think about Christmas when everybody's shopping and buying gifts. So a lot of times those product makers receive a lot of revenue in November and December. Uh, special occasions, depending on the type of service or product that you produce, you might have a really good summer month because people maybe you produce something for weddings or something that actually serves people when they go onto Palo Circuit. So you might have an opportunity of selling because you might be a producer or a seller or a reseller that is on the circuit. Uh, winter months depends on the product again that you're selling. If you make mucklocks or if you make coats or if you make moccasins or wraparounds or any of those types of things, all of your product and your services are dependent on seasonal um, changes. The bottom line is that results in increased sales sometimes, right? Uh, on slow months, post-holiday, January, nobody bothers me in December for my business because everybody's spending money. They don't want to talk about money. January, for myself, it's a little bit reversed. A lot of people want to talk about January because they, they made those New Year's resolutions to get back on the diet or get back on a budget or manage their money better and make those healthy choices. So for myself, it's a little bit reversed. Christmas, very slow for me. January, a little bit better. Um, any type of post-summer stuff, right? Because if you're going to events to sell your product, a lot of times it slows down because there isn't as many events that are happening. Bottom line, it results in a decrease of sales for yourself. Um, and a lot of times there's just some in-between times. There's no pattern to it. It's unpredictable. An example of that was COVID, right? It reduced a lot of income and a lot of spending in the traditional ways that we knew. But for a lot of online sellers, it actually increased their business. Bottom line in all of this is just you have to be aware of your market, your product, your customers, their their uh, patterns and their habits, because it actually is going to affect your income and how your income could be up for some periods of time. And it could be considerably low for other periods of time. But the risk of it is that entrepreneur may not meet those must pays of their business and their personal expenses. Or perhaps maybe they're just not ready to start planning for some of the things that they have to consider. So this is why I wanted to share a couple of these tips very quickly with you. So the budget goal, again, income needs to be equal or greater than your expenses. For someone who has fluctuating income, you want to consider creating your budget based on an average of several months of revenue. For example, if you want to use last quarter sales, which is three months average income or revenue as your income base to create your next future three months of budget. This allows you to kind of capture some of the fluctuations that might be happening. Um, an insight I want to share with you here is when you do this, are you still able to meet your business and personal must pays? Is there going to be a surplus or a deficit for you? Because you might have to average it out a little bit differently. You might have to go every four months or maybe six months and kind of build an average budget income on that with your fluctuating income. Another thing that you might want to consider in terms of managing fluctuating income is creating your budgets using the very worst case scenario month. For entrepreneurs, that means your lowest revenue month. So if you look at the worst case scenario for yourself, for me, I know December is really low, like, you know, very slow. If I was to utilize that month to create my future budgets, that means it's gotten to the lowest part income revenue as it is, as it could possibly be. We want to capture that to say, okay, I'm going to go forward with that. So everything beyond that, when I reach it, is gravy, right? It's a bonus because I'll at least know that I've, met, I've had, experienced the very worst case scenario. An insight I want to share with you here on this one is that, is your worst month able to meet your business and personal personal must pays. So you want to make sure that it's not too worst case scenario and say, you know what, I can't create a budget like this because it just isn't enough. So keep that in mind. It's one of the options for you it may not be the best for yourself or it may not work at all for um, somebody else out there. It may be ideal. A third option you want to consider is save some of your surplus revenue for, to draw cash from during the slower revenue months. So let's say that you sell a lot of product in December, but January, a lot of people have that buyer's remorse and they don't necessarily purchase a lot or they're starting their new budget or they're doing all these different things. So January might be considerably slower than December. Instead of spending all of December's money 
maybe you want to consider saving some of it because you know January cycle is pretty slow. So I want to have some carryover to cover my expenses. The insight I want to share with you here is, are you able to meet all your business and personal, personal must pays going in a budget that saves surplus revenue for the next month? Um, what about any other additional surplus? What do you plan on doing with that if it's a huge month? Do you want to carry it forward for the next month? Do you want to put it aside for savings? Do you want to reduce some expenses like debt, which also is a form of savings that could reduce next month's obligations as well? Think about those types of things when you're looking at creating a fluctuating income budget for yourself. So some more um, fluctuating income tips for entrepreneurs so on surplus months. Make sure that you do save for deficit months because you might need to draw that money in to make sure that you have stable, supportive income that is consistent. Even if it's a slow month for yourself, you can draw from previous surplus months. Make sure that you save for your tax bill monthly. And for some of you who are incorporated, your tax bill may be June if you end on a fiscal year of December 31st, or if you're a solo, solo entrepreneur, um, a sole proprietor, your tax bill is actually going to be due at the end of April of every year because as a sole proprietor, your business income is considered taxable income to you as an individual. So make sure that you want to save the money for April for the tax bill. A lot of people didn't realize this or don't realize this as an entrepreneur and they end up spending more money than they should have. Make sure that you know how much previous tax year it's going to be or how much look at your previous tax year as an example of how much you need to save as a base or do some projections and take a look and say you know what april 30th i have to pay x amount of dollars i'm going to divide that by 12 months and i'm just going to put that tax bill money away every month into a savings account a free savings account earn a little bit of interest on it and then when april comes bam i'm the boss i just pay my tax bill without having any obligation going forward Another thing I want to encourage you to do is avoid locking in or investing any type of those savings that we're asked, I'm talking about here today. If you lock it into a savings plan or an investment and you need it for two months or three months down the road or an emergency, something comes up, you can't get it. And if you do, if you do have access to it, chances are you're going to, you're going to have to pay a little bit of extra money for that, right? There's going to be some type of a, a penalty assigned to you withdrawing early so don't lock in any type of surplus savings money you just want to make sure that it's sitting in a nice little free account somewhere so that you can pull it out for the months that you need it and again that's the fourth tip look at those free accounts see what's going on with your financial uh, institution sit down and talk with them and say listen i need to create some kind of a slush fund a savings fund for the slower months can you um, provide something or give me some insight into that? So make sure you have good conversations with them about the, your goals, your hopes, the things that you need to do, not only as an entrepreneur, but also as an individual. For deficit months now, draw from those unlocked savings. That's what they're built for. That's what you're building them for is to make sure that you create some type of pocket of money or pool of money that you need it for the months that are slower. Um, revisit some of your costs. How much does it cost to make each unit that you're producing? Is there a way that you can streamline that? Are there some that are lost leaders that you just don't think you need to produce anymore because it's costing you almost as much as you earn on it? So you might have to reduce some of your, your product line. Or revisit some of your revenue streams. Take a look at some of the things that you do very well, that pay very well, that you can do quickly to increase your revenue. So it's critical for you to take a look at some of those numbers when you're having a deficit month. The fourth thing, revise some goals and or your budget. Maybe you just need to go through your budget again with a fine tooth comb and say, you know what, that needs to go. Or maybe my goal is not to do it in two years because that maybe was unrealistic. Maybe I want to do it in four or five years. So take a look at those types of things when you're working intentionally to action your budget for yourself. Um, just a couple of additional tips. Uh, planning for your own 100% of income. If you're over 100%, then you're going to need to increase your income. You're going to cut your costs. You do a little bit of both. You want to aim, once again, for more than one income stream. You want to have multiple income streams coming in because if something slows down or something reduces, you want to make sure that you have other income sources coming in to stabilize your income and your expenses. Please start saving. 
even if it's just a few dollars a month, start saving something because it matters. A few dollars, a few months right now doesn't seem like much, but with compound interest, the magic of compound interest, those dollars can go significantly over a period of years. Um, manage your debt, especially if you are looking towards entrepreneurship, because when you start looking for credit, credit cards, lines of credit, loans for your business, startup costs, those types of things. Your business doesn't have a credit history, but you as the individual owner do. So they'll be looking at your credit history when you start talking about um, lending opportunities for your business. So start looking at your debt obligations now and managing those well enough. Plus it saves you money over the long haul because you're reducing the interest costs. Plan for fluctuating income. I just gave you three different options. I'm sure there's more and more out there that you can consider that would work perfectly for you or perhaps a combination of them. Uh, know your revenue generators, right? Which is paying off better if you're doing one individual thing or if you're doing a group thing or if you're producing a number of these versus a number of those. Know which is your higher revenue generators. Tap into those when you need to as many as much as you can. Work smarter, not harder. But also know which are your loss leaders, right? So a lot of times people produce something and they think, oh, I love it, I love it, I love it. And they personalize a lot of connection to it. And it is probably a very wonderful product. But is it costing you more time, energy, resources to create it than you are earning off of it? So think about those types of things too. They're not difficult decisions, but they are meaningful decisions. And select very strong team members for your group. Make sure you have allies, make sure that you have collaborators, make sure that you have mentors, reach out to the community. We're all one family. So make sure that you can tap into those people because we all want to share the knowledge with people to support indigenous economy. That's the end of today's teachings, but please don't stop learning. Grow your abundance, read articles and books, subscribe to free resources, go online, there's Google, there's YouTube, there's a number of different opportunities. I know that Netflix had a number of different programs that were about growing wealth. Uh, attend workshops, webinars, these types of things, teach-ins, normalize talking about money and financial abundance. We have a scarcity mindset because it was imposed upon us. That's not where we resided. That's not where we were, grew like we were raised and that's not how we, we should move forward. That's not, not anything that is of us. Um, ask others. Start your legacy walk. I encourage you to do so. So we, I think we only have about two or three minutes for any questions or discussions or comments or anything you'd like to share, anybody? All right. Yeah, we have one minute left. Ken says, great tips, ideas, insight. Welcome, Patricia. Good to see you again. If you have a question, bring it on in. But keep in mind, we only have one minute. <laughs> Hi, Patricia. Hi. Hey. How are you doing, girl? Good, um, good, good. So one of the tips that I really like, and it's just more of a, a comment. So even if you're on reserve and you were talking about including your business income and in, in your personal income. So what I always recommend to individuals also is track all that income, track all of those expenses, because if you ever, as you stated, need to go for a business loan. So during COVID, they had all that emergency management money and some on reserve or indigenous owned uh, companies couldn't access it because they didn't have their financial picture in hand. It's always good to have, you know, bookkeepers uh, understand, you know, what you can track and all those other side of things. Um, I did have a quick question, though, in terms of um, even with a corporation. So how much is how how prevalent is personal budgeting if you're going to incorporate? Well, I think personal budgeting is basically it's basically critical for every individual, regardless of whether you are a business owner or as a solopreneur, an incorporated entity, as an employee, um, and all of those people, leadership even needs to be able to create their own personal budget because the personal budget is what you're going to do personally with the income, regardless of where it comes from, mm -hmm. regardless of the source is what you're going to do with it. How much are you going to move forward with it and empower yourself with your own goals and objectives, right? So I think it's critical for everybody to be able to manage with a personal budget. 
you know, multimillionaires still manage with household budgets too, right? They just have accountants and a lot of financial advisors that help them with it, but they still operate with a personal budget relational to the income that they bring into their household. Mm -hmm. So, and I agree with you in terms of looking at financial stress is such a, such a huge thing. Um, you know, we come from poverty, we come from all kinds of social economic issues, but um, so that's why even things like the IWE mentorship program, so even yourself, I don't know if you've participated, but you could sign up to be a mentor. There's a small uh, amount attached to it and, and everything that you're teaching today is, is, is all part of that. And that puts some dollars into your pocket that you can do for surplus. Uh, thanks for the advice today. And I totally agree with you. And we're welcoming in with that gratitude. I remind people to open up to those magnificent outcomes uh, mm -hmm. because we have our checklist of what we need to accomplish in a day. But I think that creator has beautiful gifts that are waiting there for us. And so uh, to me, that's part of that abundance. So nice to see you again. Thank you for everything. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments and your sharings. Let's, let's chat offline on some of those things. So open to that. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Again, you're a wealth of knowledge in, in the financial literacy piece. And I think that is so necessary. So I hope, I hope you get out there and, you know, start connecting with people because it's such an important topic to, to bring to the table and to discuss. And you're right at the very beginning, you talked about that shame piece and uh, let's talk about it. Let's develop those good relationships with you know, the people who hold our money. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, Shana had to leave. And so she's saying, thank you. Uh, she has another meeting, but we also, I believe we're send sending this, um, your PDF, your, your workshop slides to the participants if I'm not correct. I think. Yeah, I don't think we've discussed that, but I we have made an agreement that, or an arrangement that if they needed any of the actual handouts, they could connect and then we'd be able to, I'd be able to send them PDFs of the worksheet so they can kind of get started in their own personal budgeting. All right, so Shane is just requesting that, but she had to go offline. So hopefully she will connect with you at some point. Yeah. So, okay, well, be well, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Happy Halloween. Uh, and we just pray for our little ones that they have a safe you know, evening and a fun evening. It's all about the kids. So take care. We'll see you again. Be well. Thank you.